So here we are. Smash Ultimate has been out for two years now, and over that time, it's gained some pretty diehard fans. And rightly so. It's a great game. Now, you may be thinking that Smash is too big of a game to ever be replaced by some other platform fighter. And you'd be right. Smash is an absolute juggernaut in Nintendo's first party lineup, and no matter how good another platform fighting game may be, there's just no way it will ever see the mainstream success that Smash Bros. has. But even with all of that being said, if you love to play Smash Bros. the way I do, I think it would be worth your time to at least try a few other platform fighters, because in some cases, you may be surprised at what you find. If you're thinking this will be a video about another uninspired pixel art indie game that is just trying to replicate Smash's success, well, you'd be doing yourself a disservice to dismiss this game so easily. I've played a lot of games in the Smash Brothers genre, but Rivals of Aether is a completely different story. No other game I've played takes the fun and fast-paced combos of Smash Melee and combines it with the accessibility of the newer Smash games so, so well. Rivals does this so effortlessly I often forget that it isn't a real Smash game, and this is all on top of creating its own unique identity through its themes and characters. I mean, sure, it's got gameplay mechanics that feel unique and fresh to play around with, but at its core, it keeps things feeling Smash-like in the best ways possible. So if any of this sounds like something that may interest you at all, Stick around, because today, I'll be taking a look at the wonderful world of Rivals of Aether. Let's get into it. It's no secret that in 2020, we've all been spending a lot more time playing games from the comfort of our own homes. And as part of that, playing Smash Brothers locally with a large group of people at tournaments hasn't really been an option. So naturally, Smash players around the globe have done their best to find their competitive fix somewhere else, mostly by transitioning over into the wondrous world of Nintendo Online. The constant struggle of dealing with Ultimate's problematic online has just ruined my passion for Smash Bros, and I know a lot of people are in the same boat. It often feels like I'm fighting the game itself instead of fighting my opponent. But through these difficult Wi-Fi times, I've also realized it's not just the online I have problems with. There's also some fundamental design decisions that I think make the game a lot less fun to play in a competitive environment. I know I'm obviously not the greatest Smash player of all time, so these complaints do come with a grain of salt, but I'll be looking forward to the hundreds of get good comments I'm going to get either way. All in all, I've just been noticing things that make the game not as much fun for me to play lately. To keep it short, the uninteresting edge guarding and ledge trapping with most characters having pretty safe recoveries, and the awkward shielding mechanics that can leave you at disadvantage even if you parry are some of my main gripes with the game. Don't get me wrong, I love what Smash is and what it represents for gaming as a whole, and the roster will always be an unbelievable achievement on Nintendo's part. But that doesn't change the fact that I, like many, just feel totally burnt out on what Ultimate has to offer. Maybe that will change a bit with the release of Insert DLC character here. But I sincerely doubt it. The new characters are always fun for a few weeks, sure, but they don't really change my problems with the core gameplay itself. If only there was some game out there that could be everything I love about Smash, without all of the annoying mechanics that make me want to pull my hair out. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Rivals of Aether. But before we do that... To get the whole picture on Rivals' development, we need to go pretty far back, because it was influenced pretty heavily by the project that came before it. Dan Fernacy, the developer of Rivals, originally decided to try his hand at a Smash-like game way back in 2011. Oh, sorry, did I say Smash-like? No, he pretty much just remade the entirety of Smash for the Game Boy. Super Smash Land is a demake of Smash 64, reimagined with a Game Boy style aesthetic. The sprite work and stages are all redone in the signature Game Boy green color palette, and the game even features original 8-bit remixes of each stage's music. You can play as Mario, Kirby, Pikachu, and Link, and there's even two unlockable characters you can get. The first is Mega Man, which is a pretty cool addition when you realize that this game came out in 2011, a full three years before Mega Man was officially added to Smash in Smash for 3DS and Wii U. His moveset isn't exactly the same, but there is a few things that make it feel like Dan may actually be able to predict the future. I mean, come on, he has a leaf shield as down special. I'm on to you. And the other character is, well, a surprise to say the least. How about I let you guess? Who do you think it is? I'll even tell you. It's a character that's never been in Smash before. And you know what? Actually, it's a Pokemon. There you go. Any Pokemon. Take a guess. You ready? Locked in? Don't change your answer. Okay, here we go. It's Vaporeon. Yep. Seriously. 
Vaporeon is playable in this game. I can't explain the reasoning, so I'm not even going to try. The two unlockable characters are the most fun to play around with in my opinion, because the base roster is mostly what you remember from Smash 64, with little to no changes at all. Don't mistake that for a mark against the game though. It's easy to see that a lot of love was put into this project, and it came out feeling really polished. It's got great sprite work, and the game even includes extra features that didn't officially get into Smash Bros until way later, like a stage hazard toggle. Dan showed that he could make his own Smash game and have it turn out well, so the the next logical step was to take aim at something entirely unique. And of course, this spiritual successor to Super Smash Land is what eventually became Rivals of Aether. Rivals of Aether first hit Steam as an early access title in September of 2015. But I didn't play it then. I first started playing Rivals about two years later, right before the game left Early Access and fully launched in March of 2018. At the time, my friends and I were pretty burnt out on the Smash 4 scene, similarly to how I've been feeling about Ultimate lately. We were so tired of being dominated by Cloud and Bayonetta in a sluggish two-stock format, and started to look for another game we could play instead. In the end, we began to look outside of the Smash series entirely, and this is when we happened to come across Rivals of Aether. Our knowledge was limited, but judging from the gameplay we had seen, it seemed like a pretty close equivalent to Smash Bros, so we decided to give it a shot. And what we found, we immediately fell in love with. Keep in mind that a lot has changed with Rivals since 2018. There's more stages, characters, and modes, and all of it combines to make the game feel much more fleshed out as a whole. Except for maybe Tetherball, because... Did anyone even ask for Tetherball? The game is stuffed full of content now, and you can even get it on Nintendo Switch with the Definitive Edition, so there's no excuse to not give it a try. But what if I love Super Smash Brothers, but I don't have a Nintendo Switch? The first thing you'll notice when you boot up Rivals is the personality of the characters. Similarly to Smash, the main selling point here is the personalities of the avatars you choose to represent yourself within the game. But unlike Smash, booting up the game greets you with a clean, animated intro that shows off each of the game's characters and their connection to Rivals' overarching elemental theme. But seriously, the fact that an indie game like this has a better custom intro than Smash does still baffles me. do better than this in iMovie. Rival's main aesthetic is based off of the four elements, water, fire, earth, and air and each character is aligned with one of those four tribes. Once you hit the character select, you can see that the cast is actually organized by their elemental tribe, plus having the guest characters in the middle. And yes, in case you didn't know, you can play as Ori from Ori in the Blind Forest and Shovel Knight in this game. I think most people can look at this screen and immediately feel a pull towards wanting to try at least one of these characters. The designs are just so crisp and communicate what each character feels like to play so effectively. You can tell that Orcane will be a tricky technical character that can slip in and out of your combos by the big goofy grin on his face, or that Edelus is a badass heavy who hits super hard with giant hitboxes by the size of his portrait and stern look on his face. I mean, come on, out of all of these characters, you gotta admit, Edelus is pretty cool. Okay, wait, that wasn't on purpose. Each element has three characters, so with only four elements to choose from, you might think that some of the characters' designs or themes would overlap and cause them to feel the same as each other, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. Each and every character in this game plays almost completely differently from each other, and they all have at least one unique mechanic that really sets them apart from everyone else. Zetterburn, for example, has certain fire-based moves that will cause his opponents to catch on fire, and then if he hits them with a strong attack, he gets increased knockback against them. It's unique mechanics like these that give each character their own identity and make room for each and every player to find a character with a playstyle that they can really connect with. There's really not much overlap in the roster here, and unlike in Ultimate, where you can have five or more characters that all feel relatively the same with minor differences, Rivals goes for a more quality over quantity approach, and I think that makes you as a player feel a lot more personally connected to a character when you find one that you really enjoy playing. It can feel like a totally different game depending on which character you and your opponent choose to play, and although that may sound overwhelming at first, I promise it's not. I would much rather take diverse matchups with different game states and hard lines in the sand that you can really focus in on and learn about, as opposed to having a general game plan that you can apply to 30 plus different characters on the roster, and then still end up getting surprised by some of their 
better options. Yoshi can nair out of shield? Sure, it may take you a while to work your way through the roster and find a playstyle you really mesh with, but once you do, the game really opens up and starts to feel much smoother than any Smash game I've ever played. Even with these characters having drastically different playstyles, making the transition from Smash to Rivals isn't too painful. If you understand the basics of Smash, then you understand the basics of Rivals. Hit your opponent to raise their percent and increase knockback against them, allowing you to hit them off stage with your Smash. I mean, strong attacks. Yeah, they're called strong attacks in this game. Well, damn it! We almost had him! I'm a lawyer. Take your opponent's stocks as quick as you can, and if you're looking to play the game competitively, do the same best 2 out of 3s or 3 out of 5s with stage bans and counterpicking that we all know and love from Smash, and it should all start to feel very familiar. But what exactly is it that Rivals has to offer that sets it apart? Sure, the elemental theming is interesting, and a strong cast of likable characters is a must for a game like this, but what else is here that makes Rivals feel so different to play? Well, I mentioned before that Rivals has a few unique mechanics it uses to differentiate its gameplay from the platform fighting we know and love from Smash Bros., so let's take a minute and dive deep into three main design decisions that I think, overall, make the game much more fun to play. No shields. Rivals' first major departure from Smash is the way that it deals with defensive play. In a game genre that is all about hitting your opponent, sometimes it can be tough to balance defensive options with the offensive ones. If blocking isn't good enough, no one will ever do it, and if blocking is too good, the pace of the game slows to a crawl, and... well, then we'd have Smash 4. Ooh, burn! Ultimate does a pretty good job with this, but there is still quite a few out of shield options that are pretty tough to beat. Thankfully though, the shields and rivals work a bit differently than they do in Smash. In this game, they strike a great balance between offense and defense, because there are no shields. What? No way, I want my money back! When you press the triggers in Rivals of Aether, instead of shielding, you perform a parry. No, this isn't a totally useless ability that gets you hit afterwards anyway like a parry in Smash Ultimate does. In Rivals, parrying actually gives you something unheard of. Advantage. Now I don't know what that means, but I know if I did, I would be upset. Parrying an enemy's attack will stun them, giving you a free chance to punish them however you see fit. You also get a bit of invulnerability to make sure the lingering hitbox on bigger attacks won't affect you, and the stun applies to your opponent after the end lag of their move finishes. So basically, if you parry a big hit, you'll not only phase through the rest of the hitbox, but you'll also get more time to charge up a big ol' counterattack while they can do nothing to avoid the stun. Having such an aggressive, defensive option means that you can get punished pretty hard for playing in a predictable way, so you need to constantly be on your toes and mix up how you use your attacks throughout a match. Parries are far from the be-all end all though, and they do have a bit of counterplay associated with them. Parries have a lot of end lag and will usually let you get a lot of damage in if you successfully predict your opponent will try for one. You can also use your jabs to bait out parries, because only finishing the multi-jab will stun your character. Single jabs are fine and leave you free to act, so if someone parries your jab one, you can just wave dash out of it and then start charging a smash attack or something. It's also worth mentioning that the no shield design of the game doesn't mean you can just camp people out with projectiles, because parrying will reflect things back at your opponent as well. And although some characters do have command grabs, there's no basic grab mechanic in this game either, but that feels pretty natural for a game with no shielding. I mean, think about it. If grabbing was in the game, it'd be like trying to play rock, paper, scissors with only rock and scissors. Scissor? I can't lie, not having a shield is pretty tough to get used to at first, especially if you're a defensive player, but after playing with it for a while, you'll start to realize it's part of what keeps the gameplay and rivals so lightning fast and engaging. Learning to read your opponent's attacks and hitting big parries when they count is a huge part of how this game flows, and there's few things that feel better than taking someone's stock because they tried to forward air you for the 10th time in a row. As you can see, not having shields really changes up the gameplay in just about as many ways as you would think. It's a pretty large mechanic to just outright remove from a platform fighter, but it's implemented really well here, and I think it's a great idea to change things up. Moving on though, let's take a look at the second major departure Rivals takes from Smash's design to keep things moving in its own direction. Yeah, we're only on number two. We're gonna be here for a while. Dynamic Recoveries 
Recovering from being off stage is a big part of any platform fighter, but Rivals does a few things differently that make the fight to get back on stage generally more interesting than in Smash. The biggest departure for recovering may be in the design of the stages themselves, because Rivals stages have absolutely no ledges. Oh, you gotta be f***ing kidding me. This may seem like a pretty big change, and that's probably because it is. Ledges are your main objective and safety net whenever you get knocked towards the blast zone in any Smash game. So how could rivals function after removing them completely? Well, I can promise you that within the context of the game, not having ledges is actually a great thing for diversifying the gameplay. Ledges tend to cause more problems than solutions in Smash, even if we don't really realize it. Even if we ignore the extreme cases of things like planking and melee, the newer games have their own fair share of headaches that are caused by the ledge as well. The ledge always always leaves you with only a few options to get back up onto the stage, and ledge traps tend to boil down to pretty basic interactions of covering as many options as possible. Edgeguarding itself will usually be ignored in Smash in favor of a ledge trap, that is, staying on the stage instead of trying to go off the stage and stop them from getting to the ledge in the first place, because edgeguarding can be absolutely dreadful against some characters because of their huge invincible up Bs. And this is, you guessed it, not very fun. You know how most of the times when you're playing Ultimate, you hit someone off stage and you think to yourself, I'll just stand halfway to the ledge because 90% of the time their recovery is impossible to contest and I might as well just cover as many options as I can for when they do get back to the stage? Yeah, that shit sucks. Now, you might think it would be impossible to make it back to the stage without using a ledge, but I promise that's just your inner Smash player wanting to give up and cry in a corner before you even realize what you're signing up for. I need something to hold! It's a lot more difficult to successfully recover in Rivals because you need to make it all the way back to the main grounded area of the stage. So to compensate, having a few extra tricks up your sleeve that you can use to your advantage is a natural solution. In general, recovering in Smash Ultimate means you get a mid-air jump, a recovery move which is usually up special, and in certain situations, a directional air dodge. Some characters have additional tools like a side special or wall jumps or even additional mid-air jumps, but most of the cast goes without them, so we won't dive too deep into that. In Rivals, you have the same mid-air jump, recovery move, and directional air dodge, though the air dodge doesn't have nearly as much end lag and it's much better in general. Not only that, but every character was created equal in Rivals and also gets a wall jump, which can be used on every single stage. You can see we already have more practical tools here than the ones in Smash Ultimate, but that's not all. A wall jump gives you a bit of extra height, sure, but you can also wall jump while in Special Fall after you up B. So, a wall jump can not only take you out of special fall, but performing one also refreshes your up B, letting you use your main recovery tool twice. In the end, a wall jump, a mid-air jump, a directional air dodge, an up B, and another up B. Yeah, that's a lot of mix-up potential. In Smash, the only real way to mix up your recovery is changing the timing on your jump or if you air dodge or not. Up B always has to come last, for most characters anyway, because if you do it first, you forfeit your other options completely as you enter Special Fall. In Rivals, however, you have a lot more to work with. Mix-ups are a huge part of making it back to the stage alive because of the lack of ledges, so if you can predict how your opponent is going to try to recover, you can really take edgeguarding to the next level in this game. Here, you definitely get more of an advantage if you're able to push your opponent off of the stage, but because there's a lot more options given to the player trying to recover, the no ledge change is balanced out and makes for much more dynamic edgeguarding in my opinion. It just feels a lot more engaging to constantly be contesting recoveries or trying to mix your way back up onto the stage. Once again, this is something something that'll take some experience to get used to, and I'm sure you'll end up dying with multiple resources in your back pocket you forgot to use over and over again, but once you get used to it, there's a lot more player interaction and it ends up feeling better on both sides. Once you start taking some early stocks by staying active and predicting what options coming from your opponent next as they're making their way back to the stage, you end up feeling like a god at this game, which of course is an awesome feeling. Man, no ledges, no shields. You may be thinking that Rivals just takes a bunch of stuff out of Smash in order to make it less complicated, but I promise that's not the case here. This last difference between Smash and Rivals is a little bit harder to nail down than the previous two points, because it's more of a change in concept rather than a concrete gameplay mechanic, but it may just be the most important thing that Rivals does to stand out from Smash. Competitive by design, Smash Bros. at its core will always be a party game. In reality, the competitive side of Smash is such a tiny percentage of the game's player base, 
it's not even really worth it for Nintendo to spend the time or the resources to care about it too much. And as for Melee, well, Nintendo has never supported Melee and they probably never will. One of the greatest benefits of playing Rivals of Aether competitively is that the game was designed to be competitive from the ground up. Every moveset, every gimmick, every single design choice that was made for this game was made with a competitive environment in mind. And yes, Rivals does have advanced tech akin to melees, such as wave dashing and hit falling, the brother of L cancelling, but all of these mechanics are much easier to pull off consistently. The game feels as fun as melee does with its fast combos and just enough hit stun to do some really cool strings on your opponent, but there's no frame perfect tech techniques around every corner or weird modded versions of the game that raise the barrier to entry for the competitive scene. Not only do all these mechanics mesh well with each other and come together to make a great game system, but more importantly, they're easy to understand and executable after playing the game for only a few days. Now of course, there's still top players who are able to show off their mastery of the game compared to someone who only just started playing, but the game isn't nearly as unforgiving as Melee, where you have to have written an entire thesis on the GameCube controller if you even want to be thinking about being in the top 75% of players. Now I can enjoy having hands past the age of 30. I think this makes more players stick around and try to get better in Rivals and develop more love for the game overall. Everyone in the community is welcoming and they just genuinely enjoy the game, so when someone new comes along, they're happy to show people what they need to know in order to play. That's not to say you need to go looking for help when you're just starting though, because there's a pretty robust tutorial mode that teaches you pretty much everything you need to know about how the game works, both with overall gameplay and specific character guides included. That's right, you can put away the YouTube playlist of 35 videos teaching you how to play Melee properly, because this all comes hard-coded straight into the game. Well, there goes my plans for the next four hours. What? There's other benefits to Rivals' competitive by design nature as well though. Whenever there's an update, the team breaks down every change with detailed patch notes. Down to the minute percent changes or percentage of angle changes on attacks, it's crazy. Also worth mentioning is the full-hearted developer support. There's no shortage of events both online and in person. Well, that was a thing that we could do anyway. With pot bonuses everywhere and an entire online series that has run every year since the game released, you'll have no shortage of matches to dip your toes into if you're looking to become a major player in the scene. In fact, any major Smash tournament in the last few years is likely to have been sporting a Rivals of Aether bracket with the developers in attendance. It's just awesome to see this, and it shows that the transition to Rivals is a relatively painless one, as most people interested in it will likely to have been to a Smash event before. So there we have it. That's all the main gameplay and mechanical differences you'll find between Smash Brothers and Rivals of Aether. Of course, this is without diving too deep into each individual character's gimmicks and movement and combos, but that's the basic gameplay of Rivals, and it's absolutely a blast to play with, either by yourself or with a group of Smash-loving friends. Oh yeah, I guess I should mention what there is to do in the game as well, huh? Besides the regular versus mode that you'll probably be spending most of your time in, there's actually a good number of other things to do here as well, even if you're playing by yourself. The menus are also organized a lot better than they are in Ultimate. There's less modes overall, sure, but the way the categories are laid out just makes way more sense here. What mode would you like to play? Hey, thanks so much for asking. I think today I'm feeling a little frisky, so I'm gonna go with Smash. What mode would you like to play? Smash... again? Have fun, kid! Believe it or not, Rivals actually has its own story mode, and it contains unique artwork that tells the story for each of the six original characters. It won't take you long to work through it, but it's a good way to experiment with a good portion of the cast and see a bit of their personality shine through too. And hey, for those of you who are looking to really stretch the game time here, you can go for the gold time trial medals that are built into each campaign. After you complete this relatively short story mode though, you unlock Abyss mode. This is like a platform fighter version of Horde mode. You fight through waves of challenges to see how far you can get. I really appreciate how there's multiple challenges within this mode, and it's not just kill the bad guys over and over again. You'll definitely have to know your stuff if you want to make it all the way to the later stages, but thankfully you do get some help along your way. While playing Abyss mode, you can level up your characters and earn the chance to equip runes to them. You buy these runes with Aether Coins, a currency you unlock by playing each and every game mode in Rivals, so you're always working towards something no matter what mode you're playing in. Each character has their own set of handcrafted runes just for them, so each of the abilities you equip or modify are very specific, and allow you to decide on a combination that feels impactful, and in some cases, 
game-changing. More powerful runes are bigger and take up more slots, too, so it's up to you to decide if a bunch of small tweaks are more effective than a couple of extremely large enhancements. You get a lot of freedom, and there's more to play around with here than you might expect. It almost feels like leveling up a character in an RPG and creating a personalized playstyle just for you. They even went the extra mile and allow you to play regular versus matches with your runes equipped, which in most cases can be just as hilarious as it is ridiculous. Abyss mode is definitely worth checking out, and it's the secondary place that you can sink a lot of time into. I briefly mentioned the last main mode earlier, and yes, it's Tetherball. Dan is a huge memer. Not a bad change of pace every once in a while while you're in less of a competitive mood, but I mean it's tetherball. You're just gonna have to play this one yourself. Also worth noting is that this mode is not really the most balanced. There's quite a few characters that are just straight up better than other ones. I mean, you're seeing this footage, right? Rivals also supports online play, both casually or through a ranked ladder system that will take you quite a while to work your way through. Anything beats GSP though, am I right? On PC, this works great, but fair warning to anyone on Switch, the online is better than in Smash Ultimate in most cases and it runs okay, but there's only really so much you can do with the Switch's internet abilities. It's still, well, it's not great. Completely playable, definitely, but just not quite good enough to be as fun to play as it is offline. So that's pretty much it for Rivals of Aether. There's tons of extra features too, like achievements and unlocks for skins and characters. There's even the ability to make your own custom colors for the characters with a pretty in-depth color designer, which is really cool. I didn't directly mention the music either, but it's been playing throughout this entire video, and yes, all of it is absolutely amazing. If you're anything like me and you're looking for something that bridges the gap between the ultra-competitive melee and the accessible yet clunky Smash Ultimate, I think Rivals of Aether is the perfect choice. It's got intuitive and tight gameplay that just can't be beat in my opinion, and I can't recommend this game, especially to Smash fans, enough. And sure, I get it. This game doesn't have an all-star cast of video game icons from across the generations, but at the end of the day, if the game is fun, that's not really the end of the world, right? Right?